After the break, another train strike looms and uh, questions over why the Met put a 90-year-old dementia sufferer in a spit hood. Tonight, anger after a dementia patient is handcuffed, hooded and strapped down and almost tasered by the Met Police. The 90-year-old is said to have been injured in the altercation, which critics have called heavy-handed. What happened on this estate in Peckham has sparked another investigation into the conduct of Met Police officers. The Mayor said Londoners would understandably be concerned. Also tonight, she took her own life aged 14, but the Mets admitted losing vital evidence in her case. Tonight, Mia Janin's dad speaks out. I lost everything, so I will fight this until the end. Will Tottenham's old boss, Mauricio Pochettino, turn things round for Chelsea and... From the palace with love, the King thanks the Londoners who honoured the Queen at her funeral. There's anger this evening after a 90-year-old woman who has dementia was handcuffed, had a spit hood placed over her head and had a taser aimed in her direction by police. It happened early this month but only came to light today. The woman is said to have been left in complete distress and left with injuries. Our correspondent Simon Harris is on the street where it happened in Peckham tonight. Simon, what more do we know about exactly what happened here? Charlene, what happened to this 90-year-old woman in her flat on the Gloucester Grove estate in Peckham has left many of her neighbours very angry. Scotland Yard says officers went to the flat after reports of a disturbance involving the woman and her carer. One of them pointed a taser at her, illuminating her with a red dot. The taser wasn't fired, fired, but the woman was handcuffed, 90 years old, remember. And then a spit hood, one of those mesh hoods to stop people spitting, was placed over her head after she allegedly spat at an officer. I understand the woman was then led away to an ambulance and taken to hospital. Neighbours we've spoken to on this estate say she's very well known. Her dementia often makes her confused and on this occasion she was agitated. I think it's disgusting. I think it's bad behaviour from this police. Because at the end of the day, she's got dementia. The, the monster lady does it. She comes out, she empties her rubbish bag, right? And, and at the end of the day, she doesn't cause a problem to know. I've known her all my life. All my life. The case is being investigated by the Independent Office for Police Conduct and in a statement the detective superintendent in charge of policing in Southwark said while I do not wish to prejudge this process officers know that they must be able to justify any use of force or restraint and we'll ex we will expect that of the officers involved in this incident. They also know that we expect them to show compassion and to adjust their approach in real time according to the circumstances they're faced with. Well, one of the officers involved has been suspended and banned from carrying a taser. Five others have been switched to, to other duties, which doesn't bring them into contact with members of the public. Uh, news of this uh, came just hours after the Met Commissioner, Sir Mark Rowley, said that officers in the Met would soon stop responding to cases involving mental health issues. OK, Simon, thanks very much. Well, the force has been under more pressure after losing what could be vital evidence in the case of a 14-year-old schoolgirl who took her own life while she was allegedly bullied at school. Police have since said sorry to the family of Mia Janin, who's from Harrow, after losing her phone and a SIM card during the investigation. But tonight, her father, Mariano, has told ICV News he doesn't accept their apology. He's been speaking to our senior correspondent, Ron K. Phillips. This is your picture gallery. Mariano Janin with precious memories of his daughter Mia. That was in Shoreditch. Seven years after this photograph was taken, the 14-year-old killed herself after a spate of alleged bullying at school and online. Night time after 10, 10 p.m. She was, I think, until one or two o'clock in the morning on the social media and, and we heard that she was but badly bullied there and apparently cyber bullied there. In 2021, after her death, 
Mia's laptop was handed to Barnet Police along with her two mobile phones. But they now accept one of the phones and a SIM card which could have contained significant evidence needed by the coroner as part of an inquiry have been lost. The Metropolitan Police has now apologised to the family for any distress this may have caused. Apology is not accepted. That's just a word. It's not a, the apology is, uh, is not something that make me have a closure or give me any sense of justice. It's not accepted, the apology. I think there's a level of incompetence here. Um, every officer within policing will know that when they seize any form of property, it will be subject of an investigation. So somewhere, somewhere along the lines, someone has either lost that property or they didn't actually record um, it into the property stores. Mariano also has questions for social media platforms, who he says need to build in better safeguarding to prevent young people accessing harmful content. The social media companies, that's one thing. The other thing, we need an online safety bill. I'm not against technology. I think technology is an amazing thing. Internet is an amazing thing. We navigate through the pandemic because uh, using internet like a tool, but on the other hand, can be very harmful. Four months after Mia's death, her mother Marisa died after developing an aneurysm and contracting leukemia. Now living in the family home on his own, Mariano says he's a broken man, but he'll never give up his fight to find out the truth behind his daughter's death. I will carry on, and I will listen. I lost everything. So I will fight this until the end. Ron K. Phillips, ITV News. To other news now, and Sadiq Khan is under pressure from several Labour politicians to expand the £110 million ULES scrappage scheme. Four MPs and two borough leaders have called for the eligibility criteria to be widened to avoid more drivers having to pay the £12.50 daily charge from the end of August. The Labour-run Waltham Forest Council, Grace Williams, wants further support for parents and carers, as well as allowing small businesses to become eligible to take part. Benedict Cumberbatch's home in North London has been attacked by a 35-year-old man who kicked through the iron gate in his garden and ripped the intercom off the wall with a knife. The actor was at home with his wife and three children at the time. Jack Bissell was arrested after his DNA was found on the intercom and he was fined £250. And London workers at homeless charity St Mungo's have begun a month-long strike in a dispute over pay, an action that the charity described as unprecedented and disproportionate. The charity's latest pay offer of 2.25% was described as pitiful by Unite members. Workers on strikes today say the charity needs to make a better pay offer. It's just not good enough. Cost of living crisis... Inflation has been running at over 10%. Food inflation is sometimes near 20%. And St Mungo's, although it's a charity, it does have the reserves and the capital to pay us more money. Next, the first of two train strikes this week kicks off tomorrow. It's all linked to the ongoing row over pay. Well, Sam Holder is over at King's Cross for us. And there's still no sign of any solutions in this, is there, Sam? No, Charlie, and in particularly Wednesday and Saturday are set to be incredibly difficult for passengers hoping to either come in or out of the capital. Look, these strikes are part of those ongoing disputes about pay, uh, jobs and conditions. We've heard it all before, but this time we're actually seeing two separate unions go on strike three times over the next four days. So as left, the train drivers union will walk out tomorrow and on Saturday and then RMT on Friday. But really it's those as left strikes that are likely to have the biggest impact. We'll see about only 40% of services running and on some uh, operators like Southern, Southeastern, Thameslink, London Northwest, there will be no trains whatsoever, whatsoever on Wednesday or Saturday. That's set to be a particularly big problem for those living on the outskirts of London, the rest of the South East, the rest of the country, hoping to come into London on Saturday for some of the massive events that are taking place. We have the FA Cup final. Uh, we have England playing at Lords. And of course, we've got Beyonce playing at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. I doubt many fans expected it to be harder to get train tickets 
than tickets to see Beyonce herself. Indeed, Sam. Thank you. Right, still to come on the programme, we have the full forecast. Plus, is the warmer weather causing a rise in MPOX cases? Plus, a royal thank you. The King shows his gratitude to the Londoners who served at the late Queen's funeral. Next tonight, scrap the tourist tax. That's the message of the government from some of London's biggest businesses. They say that billions of pounds in VAT-free shopping is being lost to other European countries after the perk of tax-free goods was removed following Brexit. Helen Keenan has the story. From start to finish for a suit, between 80 and 100 men hours. Uh, and it's all done by hand. A labour of love but facing a cut in customers. Savile Row is synonymous with the finest suits, but buyers switching their high-end shopping to the EU to save on tax is shaping up to be a problem for the London stores. Customers that come here to Savile Row and into our little world of Mayfair, they're very financially savvy. They're very, you know, they, they will recognise uh, <laughs> that we are much more expensive for what we do, so, you know, Ultimately, the government's losing out on millions. Some houses here, 80 or 90 percent of their business is all export, so they'll, they will really be hit. Before 2021, international visitors to Britain could claim back the VAT on their shopping purchases, effectively giving them a 20 percent discount. The fact you can get that your money back in Paris, uh, that would be. Uh, make me want to wait and buy in Paris. It's really helpful for the tourists and they would come here more for shopping because, you know, you get the money back. Rishi Sunak scrapped the arrangement when he was Chancellor to save the Treasury £2 billion a year. Now, he claimed there was very little evidence that it would affect tourism, but experts say it's a setback for businesses that thrive on foreign shoppers. Some stores have already become a casualty of the so-called tourist tax. Mulberry on Bond Street closed its doors for good. And another British brand, Burberry. This is a spectacular own goal, one that can be reversed by a decision from you or from the, from the Chancellor. The boss appealing to the Prime Minister at a business conference. Doesn't the tax-free shopping only really benefit high-end retailers? Absolutely not. This is Primark to Prada. Global brands are now directing their investment to Paris and Spain and other, uh, other European cities. So for London and for the UK, this is, you know, this is a real disaster. The government say that VAT-free shopping does not directly benefit Brits and they continue to back high street retailers by reducing business rate bills by 75%. But for the Londoners working in the retail industry, it is a concern. Oh, it would be immensely sad if that, that did impact on us because there's a lot, a lot of things in the past that have impacted on the trade and as, as a whole anyway. So I can only live in hope because it's such a beautiful skill, um, it's such a beautiful craft and the quality is quite high. So I just hope that um, people will see through that and keep coming back here. For the last three years, the amount tourists have been spending on shopping in London has fallen. They're hoping that pattern will change. Helen Keenan, ITV News. Now, it's been some time since we heard the word MPOX or monkeypox, as it was formerly known. But tonight, London's gay community is being advised to take care after a cluster of new cases in the capital. Over the last week, 10 new people have been diagnosed with the virus. And there are fears that it could have come as a result of the warmer weather. Sexual health charities are calling on the government to extend its vaccination programme. A warning, Harry Fawcett's report contains pictures of some of the symptoms of the disease. Last year, London was at the centre of the UK's MPOX outbreak. Then called monkeypox, it infected mostly men who have sex with men. More than 4,000 cases confirmed nationwide. But since the turn of the year, there's been a dramatic fall in numbers to the extent that 10 new cases since the end of April represents a notable rise. It has been something that has almost disappeared from the world and it's started to resurface itself. I am friends with like a load of doctors who are urging friends who aren't vaccinated to get vaccinated just for the extra level of protection. And you know why you're here? The vaccination drive has so far proven effective. Some 72,000 people have had one dose, about half that are fully vaccinated with two injections. 
but the program is due to end by mid-June for first doses and the end of July for the second. We are approaching uh, the Pride events, festivals and people are starting to travel for the summer holidays so we need to be mindful that um, you know, MPOX is still around and we need to protect ourselves and everyone who is at risk of MPOX needs to do their part. The 2022 MPOX outbreak infected nearly 90,000 people worldwide and caused 140 deaths. The virus, which spreads through close contact, causes fever and tiredness and often painful rashes and bumps. But its peak is well past. Earlier this month, the World Health Organization declared that MPOX was no longer a global emergency. The message from clinicians and campaigners is a nuanced one. On the one hand, the decline in MPOX is very real, and the numbers who've been vaccinated against it or who've contracted it make it harder for the disease to make a major comeback. At the same time, these new figures show it is still present in the community, and with increased sexual contacts likely over the summer, it's not a risk to be complacent about. That's why the Terence Higgins Trust is calling on the government to push back the vaccination deadline. We're not talking about um, ex extending the vaccine programme to hundreds of thousands of people. We're just saying give it more time to make sure that everyone that is eligible for vaccine um, is able to, to access uh, the vaccine before the end of the programme. The UK Health Security Agency says it's closely monitoring case numbers and has the capacity to restore the vaccine programme if infection risk rises significantly. Harry Fawcett, ITV News, Soho. Frank Lampard's bid a second farewell to managing Chelsea after their worst Premier League season ever. So it's Mauricio Poch Pochettino's turn to take uh, to be tasked with taking the £600 million misfiring squad back to winning ways. Ten miles away, though, in northeast London, his former club Spurs are still waiting for a new manager of their own, as Antoine Allen reports. After making his name in North London, Mauricio Pochettino has moved to West London. His task is to bring Chelsea back up the table. The former Tottenham Hotspur manager will take charge of Chelsea after club legend Frank Lampard could only finish 12th in the league. I think it's long overdue. I think we've had two managers as of lately that haven't got any you know, real experience in the top four, you know, in challenging for Champions League, for premiership titles. And I think a lot of the fans want Potts. You know, if you look at what he did at Tottenham, he was definitely their most consistent manager. The success Chelsea fans want is only being provided by their women's team. This weekend, they secured their fourth consecutive WSL title. Chelsea legend Jilly Flaherty believes the men's team need the kind of stability Chelsea women's manager Emma Hayes has brought to her team. It's just about managing the big characters and the big players that he's got in the team and, and working them well together. It's a cliche, but it's what Emma's done in regards to having Harder and Sam Kerr and Frank Kirby. When she signed those, a lot of people said, are hey, you going to fit all those in one, in one team? But she's just done that and, yeah, the men need to just duplicate what she's doing. Chelsea's American owner Todd Borley has spent over half a billion on players and overseen four different managers. Blues fans hope Pochettino's arrival signals a change in strategy. The new manager is what's needed to change the club and the whole philosophy of the club needs to move on from last season. Last season was a total disaster for everybody. Chelsea have won every major cup in domestic and European football, but still haven't managed to find a long-term winning strategy for recruiting managers. Many of the best managers in the world have called Stamford Bridge home, from Jose Mourinho to Carlo Ancelotti and Thomas Tuchel. But no matter who the owner is, whether it's Roman Abramovich or now Todd Borle, the demands are exactly the same. This is a club that wants and needs success. So when Richard Portrettino takes over and steps into that dugout, into that hot seat, he'll know he'll need to add more titles to that list. Pochettino starts work on the 1st of July. Knowing Chelsea's track record, there's no guarantee he'll make it to the end of his two-year contract. Antoine Allen, ITV News. Premiership club London Irish have been given an extra week by the Rugby Football Union to complete a takeover of the club. A deadline of the 30th of May had been set by the RFU with the club's future in the Premiership at risk. But it's understood that another week will be allowed if the current ownership can prove that the players' salaries are paid by on Wednesday. The ITV News continues with the national headlines at 6.30. Here's Mary with the details. Coming up on the programme, the government's pledge to protect under-18s from e-cigarettes. 
Rishi Sunak says retailers should be banned from giving children free vape samples. But critics say the government should be even tougher. Also tonight, the boss of Asda tells us a voluntary price cap for supermarket food won't ever work. Plus, a total cover-up. The claim from Eamon Holmes over the controversy surrounding his former colleague, Philip Schofield. Do join me for those stories and much more at 6.30. Now, it's not every day that you hear a song about mental health from a successful music artist, but that's exactly what our guest tonight has decided to do with her song about her journey with ADHD. Just makes you want to get up and dance, doesn't it? That's Tears, performed by Becca, who joins us now. Thank you so much for coming in to Thanks talk to us. Me. I love that video, it's brilliant. Um, now, let's talk about your diagnosis, because it's quite recent, yes. isn't it? I mean, why yes. did you decide to get tested? I think I just had so long of feeling so overwhelmed, and I think a big part of ADHD, especially in women, is that we often feel this kind of sense of not being able to adult. And it was actually um, a presenter called Abby McCarthy who came out and said she had ADHD, yes. which led me to start reading about it and be like, I can't believe these symptoms that you're describing are symptoms of something, because these are just the things I yeah. you know, struggle with every day. And has it made life slightly easier knowing that you've, yeah. you've got that diagnosis? Absolutely. It was, it's probably been the biggest relief of my entire adult life. Wow. It's, it was such a profound moment. I think to just have a framework to be able to understand yourself is so unlocking. It's been so empowering. And also, I think, you know, challenging, but it's much better to understand something and be able to work within that framework than not, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. And you decided to incorporate it into your music, but yes. why? Uh, so I was in a session with a dear friend and I was just feeling this kind of overwhelm, the whirlwind. Went out, started to make some tea, had a little cry, and then had this little melody come. And the song kind of started with me feeling that, you know, spilling over, always being a whirlwind, and then ended post-diagnosis. So the song really does map, wow. like, the reality of the of the journey of, you know, becoming diagnosed. And now that's something you've done with your music for quite a while, isn't it? Sure. Because I'll Be There was the first song off your first album. Yes. And that talk, that was like a, a love letter almost to your husband for his yeah. support and help during your mental health struggles. Is it important for you to incorporate this level of truth into your music? I think absolutely. For me, I just write about the things that are happening in my life. I That's what I love about music it's medicinal and it kind of comes from this invisible beautiful magic place so I think if I'm going through something it's going to come out in my writing whether I want it to or not often very subconsciously yeah <laughs> well and it does help other people I mean I've read so many wonderful testaments that people have written regarding that track and in terms of Thank how you. much it's helped them now you've been living in London for quite some time now do you feel like London has influenced your music or given you a level of confidence in your music absolutely London is like it's just such a form of energy for me. I think you walk out of your home and you see people who are doing things that you never thought people that look like that would be doing. Um, it's It makes me feel bigger as a person and I think that kind of diversity and the eclectic mix of just possibility yeah. is a really gorgeous thing. It's like a substance that you just, you know, gets in your skin. I love that description. Yeah. And is there any one place in London that you would say you sit to get inspiration or just inspires you? Yeah, I love Hampstead Heath. You know, when you get up onto just the Heath, you've got your flask of tea, you sit like a little nana, just sitting there with my little blanket and <laughs> do my tea. you a blanket over your knees? Oh, God, I do take a, a blanket sometimes. Yeah, I can't, I can't lie. I am literally my grandma. I am her. Yeah, I love Hampstead Heath. Because that's the beautiful thing, isn't it, about London, is that it, yeah. it's such a creative place to be. Right? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> People used to go there apparently for healing back in yes, the day. They it was did. like a place of healing, so I definitely feel that. There is. There's a lot of history there at One Hamster Heath. Well, Becca, mm. thank you so much for coming in to thank talk you for to us. Me. And um, and good luck with the track. Thank you. <laughs> Now, a reminder now of our main headline tonight. The Metropolitan Police are to be investigated after an elderly woman with dementia was placed in a spit hood and threatened with a taser gun. The 90-year-old was restrained by police in Peckham after an altercation with her carer before being taken to St George's Hospital. Well, let's talk about the weather because it's definitely taken a turn and apparently some parts recorded their hottest days this weekend and uh, apparently it may well continue for the rest of the week so we shall keep our fingers crossed but there is a woman in the know and that'll be Philippa Drew. Here she is. ITV London Weekday Weather is sponsored by Octopus Electric Vehicles. Car, charger and energy. 
Hello there. Well, it has been a very decent day out there for many of us. Despite the earlier cloud, the sunshine has come through. And in the best of that sunshine, it's actually felt fairly warm. And it sets the tone for the next few days. Plenty more in the way of sunshine to come. Rather warm for most of us as well. But we'll hold on to a bit of a northeasterly breeze. And that will make it feel just a little fresher in places. Out there at the moment, we're seeing cloud now starting to encroach again from the east. That will spread its way westwards as the night wears on. And underneath that cloud, well, it will be a relatively mild night lows for many of us staying in double figures. Tomorrow morning then much the same as this morning quite a bit of cloud on the scene initially but again as the day wears on the sun will get to work burning a lot of that cloud off and as we head into the afternoon it's looking very promising indeed. A good deal of dry and fine weather in the best of the sunshine towards the west of the patch high similar to today 20 or 21 celsius but with that northeasterly breeze always feeling a little fresher the further east you go. Now as we head through the latter stages of tomorrow again a repeat performance so clear skies to start the evening and then clouds starts to encroach from the east once more but for the next few days really more of the same staying settled dry sunny and warm in western parts at least ITV London weekday weather is sponsored by Octopus Electric Vehicles hello summer Piri sponsors ITV pollen count and of course, it's perfect conditions for pollen to be on the move over the next few days. Dry, plenty of sunshine and a breeze as well. And as a result, grass pollen levels will generally be in the high category. Take care. And finally, they were the Royal Navy personnel who marched the late Queen's coffin along the procession route at the funeral. Well, today, King Charles had the opportunity to thank them personally with a special honour for the work that they carried out in front of the eyes of the world. Among them was Londoner Commander Nicola Cripps, who was part of the gun carriage crew. Anil Adami reports. <laughs> A special parade for a rare recognition. Around 150 members of the Royal Navy have received a Royal Victorian Order from His Majesty King Charles at Windsor Castle in recognition of their role in Queen Elizabeth II's funeral procession and serving their former Commander-in-Chief, his late mother, until the end. Being able to be selected for the gun carriage crew was a huge honour and privilege. And to be back here today um, is something really proud um, and brings me immense pride um, after 18 years serving in the Royal Navy. Commander Cripps from Maidenhead was one of the officers who drew the state gun carriage bearing Her Late Majesty's coffin in London last September. As the funeral cortege passed um, through, the, the crowds fell silent um, and the connection between people became very apparent. Individuals would reach out and, and touch each other um, as they saw the gun carriage pass. Um, and it, so it meant that as a, as a group, as a body of, of men and women, um, we were really united in that unique experience um, of taking the Queen to her final resting place. King Charles subsequently released the Demise Honours list to mark the part service personnel played in one of the biggest events in history. The gold, silver and bronze medals of the Royal Victorian Order were founded by Queen Victoria in 1896 and are given at the discretion of the Sovereign, independent of the Prime Minister. Today, those on the fourth ever Demise Honours list stood before the King as a national anthem played. and shared words with their new commander-in-chief. And a treat for loved ones waiting outside the castle grounds, the king was talking and laughing with them. A high accolade that the king is also awarding soldiers, members of the Royal Air Force, engineering technicians and more for their part in the late queen's funeral. On a day to remember, but also to celebrate. A role they would have prepared for for years and an honor they'll carry forever. Anila Dami, ITV News. And from the King to Queen B, Beyonce kicked off the London leg of her first tour in seven years last night. 70,000 fans went crazy in love at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium as the Renaissance tour began its seven-night residency, attended by the likes of Dua Lipa and Kris Jenner, as well as Beyonce's husband, Jay-Z. A tribute was paid to the late great Tina Turner with a gospel version of River Deep, Mountain High. 
Well, that's it from us for now. The LTV News at 6.30 is up next with Mary. But for now, from all of us on the London team, enjoy your evening. Bye-bye.